When America's founders crafted the Declaration of Independence, they threw in a line there that now is famous and familiar. We hold these truths to be self-evident, they said, that all men are created equal, that they're endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, among these life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now, it's quite familiar to us today, but you have to remember that was a pretty stunning sort of line because in most societies throughout the history of the world, that truth wasn't self-evident. It was in no way evident that all men were created equal. Even our founders, of course, failed to live up to that high ideal, but that ideal wasn't a part of most civilizations to begin with. I mean, after all, some were strong, some were weak. Some were free, some were slaves. Some were male, some were female. Some were smart, some were foolish. Some were young, some were old. Some were fast, some were slow. There was all kinds of obvious differences. So where did this idea that all men are created equal, where did it come from? It couldn't have come from observation because all these differences exist. Well, if it didn't come from observation, it had to come from the world of ideas. So where did this radical idea come from? It had to come from the world of ideas. But which system of thought could sustain this idea? If you go to anything based in Darwinian evolution, this idea that humans are nothing but animals and the story of the world is that of natural selection where the strongest weed out the weak and the fittest weed out the unfit, well, there's no grounds for human dignity or equality there. If you go to the Eastern religions, especially Hinduism, I mean, the, the distinction between human persons is grounded in guilt from a former life. The belief in reincarnation and that you come back in this life based on what you did in a past life gave rise to the idea of the caste system. And so there was no equality there. In Greek thought, which gave us the foundations of Roman society and so on, the world of ideas was so separate from the world of experience that it was the privileged few that got to be philosophers while everyone else was kind of tasked with being a slave or at least having to do the menial labor. So there was no equality there either. So which system of thought gave us equality and human dignity? So none of these systems of thought could give us human equality and dignity. It was the Judeo-Christian framework of reality that gave us this concept of equality and dignity. I mean, think about it. If people are going to be created a certain way, first of all, there has to be a creator. And there can't be many creators. There can't be many gods like many of the pagan societies believed because then they would all control different aspects of creation and there wouldn't be that uniform human dignity and equality either. In fact, even atheists like the French philosopher Luke Ferry in his book, A Brief History of Thought, recognizes that you don't have any sense of equality and dignity until Christianity brings it to the world. Here's what he says. Christianity was to introduce the notion that humanity was fundamentally identical, that men were equal in dignity, an unprecedented idea at the time, and one to which our world owes, get this, its entire democratic inheritance. Ferry identifies three aspects of the Christian understanding of humanity that made all the difference in bringing about equality and dignity. First was the concept of freedom, that humans were free moral agents as created by God and not just the peons of the pantheon, you know, that were just doing the will and the whim of the gods in the first place. Secondly was the power of the inner man. In other words, what brought human value was not something on the outside, but something on the inside and our moral formation was more important than just our moral obedience. And then third was that this status was endowed across humanity. It wasn't just for this group of people or that group of people, but there was a common human brotherhood that included all human persons. And of course, all three of those things flow from this basic understanding that humans were made in the image and the likeness of God. And what this reality brought to the world is incredible. The number of cultural goods, when you look at it, is really astounding. This idea suggested that there should be freedom for all, not just some. It suggested that work is fundamentally good and not just kind of the bad state of the underclass, but that there's actually something of inherent value in what we do and bring to the world. It also brings in the care for others, all classes, all races. After all, it was the Christians who stuck around to care for the sick when the Romans fled the plague. It was the Christians who went out and gathered all the little baby girls that the Romans threw out to die from exposure. In fact, Rodney Stark says this is how the church grew because a couple generations after the Romans killed all the baby girls and kept all the baby boys, the boys needed to go somewhere to find wives and they went to church. Imagine that. It was the Christians who actually led all the abolitionist movements. In fact, Rodney Stark also says that it was only out of a Judeo-Christian society that the very idea 
that slavery wasn't actually a normal part of human existence came to mind. Before that, slavery was just considered as normal as anything else. But the Christians thought, wait a minute, no, it shouldn't be normal. And it was the Christians whose care for the sick and the poor and the needy led to so many benevolent efforts. And that's why we see across the West Christians leading the way in hospitals and in care for the needy and feeding the poor and so on. It's part of our Christian heritage. Not only that, but it was Christians who pioneered religious freedom. Because if you believe that humans are made in the image and likeness of God and have personal moral freedom, then you also believe that they have the freedom to believe what they want. And it was the Christians, although they didn't always live this out across the board, the Christians who pioneered the very concept of religious freedom and freedom of conscience, which of course Americans consider to be our first freedom. And it was Christians who believed that the creation could be cultivated and stewarded to produce wealth and prosperity that would lift people out of poverty. They didn't just care for this sick person or that sick person. Rodney Stark argues very compellingly in The Victory of Reason that it's from Christianity that you get the idea of markets and work and dignity and, and so on that lifted so much of Europe out of poverty. It was Christians who believed that the world could be studied and known and that they had a capacity to understand the world. And this gave birth to the rise of science. In fact, all the fathers of modern science believed in God. Kepler thought, quote, he was thinking God's thoughts after him. And it was Christians who believed that that same learning was available to everyone, not just for the privileged few, but that everyone should have the opportunity and the chance to get an education. And it was Christians who believed that love, not power, was the best way of advancing truth. And so from Christians, and nowhere before that, do you get the idea of universal human rights. Now, none of this is to say that Christianity always lived up to its own ideals, or that Christians always did what they were supposed to do according to the teaching of Christianity. But it's true that the only place you get these ideas, the only place that they entered the world scene, was from the Christian understanding of the image of God and the inherent dignity and equality of all people.